Welcome to part six in our verse-by-verse -verse survey of the book of Hebrews. And today we're going to tackle chapter four, verses one through 13, which continues a lengthy warning or exhortation that began in the last chapter. And as you can see from our roadmap, we're still early in the journey. And in this chapter, the author is going to continue with an important ana analogy that he introduced in Hebrews 3, that of holding fast to our faith so we can enter into God's rest. And as usual, we're going to be leaning on a lot of background that we've already covered in this series. So to catch it all, it's probably best to watch it all in order. But in a nutshell, here's the story we're picking up on today. So in the book of Numbers, God promised the Israelites that he would give them the land of Canaan. But when they saw who was in the land, they got scared and didn't believe God's promise. They wanted to go back to Egypt instead. So Yahweh told an entire generation of Israelites that they would not enter the promised land, which Psalm 95 calls God's rest. An entire generation of Israelites died in the wilderness because of their unbelief. And the author of Hebrews uses that story to warn his readers, don't be like your ancestors who all fell in the wilderness because of their lack of faith. As you'll see, he's drawing an analogy between the promised land as God's rest and eternal life as God's rest. And in the same way that the Israelites didn't make it into Canaan because of their lack of faith, our lack of faith is what will keep us from entering eternal life, or as the author puts it, entering God's rest. And now he's going to expand on that analogy and connect God's Sabbath rest on the seventh day of creation with our rest in Christ. So in the last verse of the previous chapter, the author planted a seed that's going to bloom into a surprising and for some a controversial idea in this chapter. In Hebrews 3.19 he wrote, So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. As he's going to expound on in our passage today, it wasn't a lack of works, but a lack of faith that kept the ancient Israelites from entering God's rest. So let's read through this whole passage first so we can really get a sense of his flow of thought and the case that he's making. And then we'll go back and look at it verse by verse. And, and, and as I read this, pay attention to how many times and in how many different ways the author alludes to rest. Right? Ask yourself, what does he mean by the word rest? Okay, Hebrews 4, chapter 1, the word of God. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us, just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. As he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest." although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, They shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day, today saying through David so long afterward in the words already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account." Whew, man. Such a dense and deep text. Now, back when he began this thought in, in chapter 3, he really only mentioned rest once. And, and in chapter 3 talks about 
being in the wilderness and entering Canaan and not having evil, unbelieving hearts that leads you to fall away from the living God. He was setting the table for the the larger point that he makes here in chapter 4. And he starts by saying, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands. Now, previously he talked about how the unbelieving Israelites did not enter God's rest. It, It didn't happen for them. But for us today, he says, the promise of entering his rest still stands. So what promised rest is he talking about? What's still out there and available for God's people? What is this thing about which he says in verse 1, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. Now, understanding what the author means by rest is actually the key to understanding this whole passage. And it's why I'm in front of the chalkboard for this episode, because before we go back and walk through the passage verse by verse, we're gonna take a little sidebar and get somewhat technical and lay out what the author's doing in a way that will hopefully help us to see the dots that he's connecting and why he's connecting them. I think you're gonna find it fascinating. We've talked before about how chapter and verse numbers in the Bible were a later addition for the convenience of Bible readers. They they weren't part of the original text, and it's always best to follow the contours of the author's thought rather than the chapter numbers. And what we're looking at today is a perfect example. So the author of Hebrews actually starts by talking about a rest for the people of God back in chapter 3, verse 7, right? So that... That thought then carries through through chapter 4, verse 13. So that's our larger passage where the author is is laying out his argument or his exhortation about entering God's rest. And in that larger passage, we've seen him quote from the Old Testament numerous times, right? So here in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, he quotes from Genesis 2-2, which says, God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And he's quoted a few times from Psalm 95, which says, they shall not enter my rest. So on what basis is the author connecting these two seemingly unconnected passages, right? We've got the creation account in Genesis and then a Psalm about worship and warning. Well, this is another good reason to think, as we talked about early on, that the unnamed author of Hebrews is most likely a Jewish man writing to a primarily Jewish audience. Because what he's doing here is using an ancient Jewish method of interpretation called Gezerah Shiva, which in Hebrew means equal category. Or, or when it's used to interpret Jewish law, it's sometimes said to mean similar laws, similar verdicts. So, Gezerah Shiva is the exegetical method of linking passages based on an identical word or phrase shared by both passages. Now, this is an approach that can obviously be taken too far and lead to some highly questionable connections. We see a number of examples of this in in rabbinic literature. But when it comes to the book of Hebrews, we're talking about a biblical author. This is inspired scripture. So, What word or phrase is he connecting between Genesis 2, which says, God rested on the seventh day from all his works, and Psalm 95, which says, they shall not enter my rest. Well, the connection he finds is in the word rest. And both passages actually refer to a specific rest, God's rest. Now, because he's quoting from the Old Testament, we might assume that the word in question is Shabbat, or Sabbath, which is the Hebrew word for rest. But that's actually not the case. And here the plot thickens. So the author of Hebrews, as he often does, is quoting from the Septuagint, which is abbreviated with the Roman numeral 70. This is the the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. We talked about this in detail in the first episode in this series about how the writer of Hebrews most often quotes from the Septuagint rather than the original Hebrew text. And I mentioned that we're going to run into cases where the author's basing his theological point on something the Septuagint says that differs from the traditional Masoretic text of the Hebrew Bible. And this is one of those cases. So 
The reason the, Septu the Septuagint was created was because the Hebrew language was dying out, right? And Greek had become the common tongue among the Jewish people in the diaspora. So a Greek version of their Bible was created so that the average Jewish believer could read their own scriptures. And by the way, here's a fun fact for you. Some people want to claim that it was only the Torah, the first five books of the Bible that were translated into Greek prior to Jesus. But the fact that the author of Hebrews, as well as other New Testament authors, quote from the Septuagint tells us that the entire Hebrew Bible, not just the Torah, had been translated into Greek before the first century. In the, in the passage we're looking at, we see him quote from the Septuagint translation of the Torah and the Psalms, and he'll later quote from the prophets multiple times. Okay, so the word that the author of Hebrews uses to connect these two passages is rest. And that doesn't come from the Hebrew word Shabbat, but rather the Greek word katapasis, which means to rest or cease or stop. And the author's using this shared word katapasis to clarify the text of Psalm 95 in light of Genesis 2. In other words, he's interpreting the meaning of rest in Psalm 95 on the basis of Genesis 2.2, right? And here in our passage, he mentions three times the idea of God resting from his works, which comes from Genesis 2. In fact, the way he structures his, his ideas really drives this point home. And here I'm going to lean on some insights from Professor Brian Whitfield. So there's a literary technique called chiasmus. And it's found all throughout the Bible, right? It's an approach that was commonly used by the biblical authors. And therefore, it was looked for and understood by the ancient readers of the Bible. And we can easily miss it today if we don't know what we're looking for. But once you're aware of it, it becomes a sort of literary rhythm that, that jumps out at you. Right? So chiasmus is when an author lays out a sequence of thoughts in a certain order and then repeats those ideas in reverse order. So a chiastic structure is often written like this. The first idea, A, is followed by the second idea, B, and then the idea of B is repeated, right? often but not always using parallel language. And then finally, the idea of A is repeated. Right, so A, B, B, A. Maybe the most simple example of this is when Jesus said the Sabbath, A, was made for man, B, not man, B, for the Sabbath, A, right? So Sabbath, man, man, Sabbath, right? That's the idea of chiasmus. And there are a range of chiastic structures in scripture that go to different levels. For example, sometimes the structure has a single central idea that's not repeated, right? So this would be written as A, B, and then C, and then B, and then A. So there's a simple example of this structure in John 4. It starts with the phrase in verse 23, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. So A is the idea of worship in spirit and truth. Okay, and then it goes on to say, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. So B is worship him. Then we get to C, it says, God is spirit. All right, and then we see B repeated. It says, and those who worship him, and then A is repeated, must worship in spirit and truth. There we go. So you see that pattern. And, and let me read this full passage, and then, and then you can kind of hear the rhythm of it. I'm just going to read it. We're in John 4, verses 23 and 24. It says, But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. This is a cadence that's found all throughout the Bible in the Old and New Testaments. It even comes through in our English translations. And this is the type of five-part chiastic structure that we find in our passage in Hebrews. And here's the thing. 
When you've got a central idea in the middle that's not repeated, the author's giving prominence to that statement. It's going to be the main point of the passage, or in some cases, it's the pivot or the turning point of the passage. Now, this might seem strange to our modern sensibilities where we use linear logic, right? We're used to building an argument one idea at a time in one direction, and the final statement is the most important. That's our conclusion. But that's not the ancient logic behind chiastic passages. What we're supposed to do with these passages, and ancient readers knew this, is view them as a whole. And sometimes there's an even deeper level of meaning to be found in, in comparing or contrasting the pairs of ideas, right? The A's and the B's, right? Sometimes the repeated A and B idea use different language than the first A and B. And looking at those differences can really reveal additional meaning. Now, in this example in, from John 4, it's more of a straightforward repetition intended to point the reader to the big idea, which in this case is that C, God is spirit. Okay, so in Hebrews, we find an even more sophisticated version of this ABCBA chiastic structure, right? And it has to do with the passages that the, that the author quotes from the Old Testament. So if we examine the passage from Hebrews 3.15 through 4.7, here's what we find. The A statement is a quote from Psalm 95. And this is found in Hebrews oops, 3.15. And then the B statement is another quote from Psalm 95. And that is found in Hebrews uh, 4, 3. Okay. And then the C statement is the quote from Genesis 2, which is found in Hebrews 4, 4. Okay. Now, a repeated B statement is another quote from Psalm 95, uh, which we find in Hebrews 4, 7. Oops, going too fast here. And then finally, the repeated A statement is yet another quote from Psalm 95, which we also find in Hebrews uh, 4, 7. There we go. So we see Psalm, Psalm, Genesis, Psalm, Psalm. It's sort of a Genesis sandwich <laughs> where the meat of it is the verse, God rested on the seventh day from all his works. That's what the author's directing his reader's attention to. That's his central point, right? And that is the kind of rest that the author's talking about in this larger passage. Here's how Professor Whitfield puts it. Given this focus on Genesis, the phrase, my rest, is no longer the rest that God provides in the land of Canaan, but the rest in which God participates, the primordial rest of the creation story, a rest better than the one promised, the wilderness generation. And as we'll see as we return to the text, the rest that the author's talking about is a rest from work. And he's using the idea of God's rest to speak of eternal life of salvation. And in the same way that a, a lack of faith kept the ancient Israelites in the wilderness from entering God's rest, a lack of faith today can also keep us from entering God's rest, his salvation. All right, so let's walk through this remarkable text. Verse one, therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. So the promise of salvation still stands. If you have breath in your lungs, you still have a chance to place your faith in Jesus and enter God's rest. And of course, the author is using the imagery of the Israelites who failed to enter Canaan and died in the wilderness. He doesn't want the believers that he's writing to to miss out on the chance that's still available for them to enter God's rest. And he continues, verse 2. For the good news came to us just as to them, but the, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. So he says, for good news came to us just as to them, the ancient Israelites in the wilderness, and he calls the promise of entering God's rest good news. This is gospel language. And this gospel or good news, he says, was proclaimed to the ancient Israelites. You know, sometimes Christians can have a, a superficial understanding of the Old Testament, right? It's all too common for people to say, well, in the New Testament, we have the gospel, but in the Old Testament, it was all about laws and regulations. 
right? But that's actually not the case at all. The Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, is full of grace and mercy and, yes, the gospel. We could even say that the gospel is the primary message of the Old Testament. It goes all the way back to the garden in Genesis 3.15, which is called the Proto-Evangelion, the, the first gospel. It says the seed of the woman, which ultimately refers to Jesus, will crush the head of the serpent, but his heel will be bruised in the process. That's the gospel message. And from that verse on, this theme of God working out his plan to redeem his people from sin continues and grows. Right? Paul says in Galatians 3.8, that the gospel was preached beforehand to Abraham. And just like the New Testament gospel, in order for it to be efficacious, the Old Testament gospel had to be accepted by faith. It wasn't enough to, to just hear the words. The author of Hebrews says, but the message they had heard did not benefit them. Why? Because they were not united by faith with those who listened. Or some translations say, they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. This harkens back to the Hebrew word Shema. We looked at that in an earlier episode. Shema doesn't simply mean to hear something. It means to hear and obey. So the author is warning his readers that the ancient Israelites heard the good news, but they didn't believe it. God promised them the land, but they didn't believe him, and they wanted to go back to Egypt instead. And because of that unbelief, they died in the wilderness and never entered God's rest. This is a powerful image of the gospel today. Many people may hear the good news, but in the end, if we don't believe it, if we don't actually put our faith and trust in Jesus, we won't make it into God's rest, into eternal life. And this isn't about God sending people to hell just for not behaving how he wants them to. No, some people see God like that, but that's not the God of the Bible, not at all. God plainly and openly tells everyone the way to eternal life and salvation. But some of us just refuse to believe him. And it's our own unbelief that prevents our salvation. In his book, The Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis wrote this. There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Those who seek, find. To those who knock, it is open. Okay, so the author of Hebrews continues in verse 3. For we who have believed enter that rest. As he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. And this is actually a pretty unexpected mixture of ideas here, especially if we're not aware of the author's use of Gezerah Shiva and the larger chiasmus that we looked at, right? In verse 3, the author cites Psalm 95, they shall not enter my rest, and directly links it to Genesis 2, saying, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, right? He's directing his readers to that C idea in the center of the chiastic structure which he then directly states in verse 4. For he is somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. He's quoting Genesis 2, 2 and talking about creation, and in the next verse, he again links that to Psalm 95. Verse 5, and again in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. So this is his Genesis 2 sandwich, right? And the meat of his argument, as it were, the central point of his chiasmus, is the idea of God resting from all his works. And again, if we're not aware of the ancient Jewish methods of interpretation that the author uses, and the fact that he quotes from the Septuagint, it's easy to wonder what the heck he's doing. Right? In fact, this has led some people to criticize the author for taking way too much license with the Old Testament text. Some even say, for example, our Jewish friends who reject Jesus and reject the New Testament, they'll claim that the author of Hebrews is just randomly cherry-picking verses and connecting them together in entirely inappropriate ways, that he's making up connections that don't really exist. But as we've seen, there's actually a method to his exegesis, right? 
And on top of that, the book of Hebrews is an inspired text. It's part of Holy Scripture. And it goes on to say in verse 6, Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. So again, the rest that the author's talking about is a rest that remains open for his readers. Right? And he reminds them again that the ancient Israelites failed to enter God's rest because of what? Their disobedience. Now, earlier in the last verse of chapter 3, he said they were unable to enter because of unbelief. And here he says it's because of disobedience. So for the author of Hebrews, unbelief or a lack of faith is disobedience. And in fact, God does command us to believe. 1 John 3, 23 says, uh, and this is God's commandment, that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as He commanded us. So the writer of Hebrews is telling his readers, don't be disobedient, right? There's a rest that remains for you. It's a rest of eternal life, of salvation, and you enter it through faith in Jesus. So let's take a minute here to contemplate this central point that the author is laboring, this C in his chiastic structure. For six days God created the light and the dark and the stars and the sun and the sea and the dry land and plants and animals and mankind, right? And then God rested. Genesis 2 says, And on the seventh day God finished His work that He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work that He had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all His work that He had done in creation. And, and creation, of course, would later become the, the source of the seven-day pattern that God gave Israel in the weekly Sabbath rest, right? But of course, God's rest on the seventh day of creation wasn't a, a rest of tiredness or inactivity. It was a rest of completion. He didn't go back to work the next day and create more things, right? God created everything, and He pronounced it all good, and then He rested because He was done. The idea here is that of a perfected state, right? This was the intended state of God's universe. There was Adam and Eve, you know, serving as, as the king and queen, as it were. God gave them dominion over nature, and they rested with God in His rest, in the perfection and completion of His creation. And unlike the weekly Sabbath that would be given later, theirs wasn't a rest from labor. They actually had jobs. Genesis 1.28 says, and God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So God blessed labor, and He gave mankind a noble job to do. We were to partner with Him in ruling over creation. So the rest that Adam and Eve enjoyed with God wasn't a rest of inactivity, it was of peace, of shalom, of blessedness in God's presence. It's this very intimate idea of family, right? Of dwelling with our Heavenly Father in His presence as a member of His household. This is a soul rest, so to speak. And of course, that was lost when the great deceiver entered the picture and enticed Adam and Eve into disobedience and unbelief. Did God really say you can't eat of that tree? And as a result of that sin, things were broken. Now, the work of Adam and Eve and, and all humanity was going to involve pain and, and toil and frustration. And there's also a sense in which God went back to work, so to speak, after that first sin. He began working out His plan of redemption. In, in fact, even before Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, God inaugurated a plan for restoring His ultimate Edenic vision, for restoring His perfect rest. And it's in that sense that the death and resurrection of Jesus can be seen as inaugurating the eighth day of creation. Right? In Hebrew categories, the number seven represents fullness or completeness. In fact, the Hebrew word for the number seven, Shiva, shares the same root as the word for complete or full. And in Hebrew thinking, the number eight represents new beginnings. So it's no coincidence that Jesus was resurrected on the eighth day of the week, not the seventh day. And also, 
the Holy Spirit fell in Jerusalem on Pentecost to start Jesus' new church on the eighth day of the week, not the seventh day. So in the garden at the first sin, God began a new work of redemption and guiding all of creation back into his rest, his vision of Eden, right? The shalom of his presence in his household. God is going to renew Eden and, and dwell again with his people, with his family. And here's what I find fascinating. After that first sin, God could have simply hit the reset button and reestablished Eden without taking all this time and going through all the trouble that he has. But that's not how he, that's not how he chose to do it. And the reason that he's playing the long game, that after thousands and thousands of years, Eden has still not been restored, is because he wanted to partner with us, with fallible human beings who were made in his image and who he loves. Now, he doesn't need us in order to pull this off, yeah, pull, pull this off, of course, but he wants us to participate, right? He wants to adopt us into his family. This tells us a whole lot about the heart of the living God. It's taking a long time to reestablish his ultimate rest because God is committed to redeeming all of creation with the participation of, of knuckleheads like you and I. God didn't cancel our free will or, or force us to sit on the sideline. He wants to give us, his children, the blessing of partnering with him in his work. And because that's the way he chose to do things, it's taking a long time, at least from a human perspective, to reach his ultimate final rest in the fully renewed Eden. And the Old Testament is full of foreshadows and images of this future rest, right? The Garden of Eden, the Promised Land, the Temple. These are all symbols of it. These are all places where God and his people, his family, dwell together and rest. Michael Heiser offers some great insight here. He says, Genesis 1 describes the creation of the heavens and earth in the same mode as the building and sanctifying of a temple because that's what God's temple is. It's on earth. It's in Eden. This is where the creation episode ends because God has now taken up his residence on earth in his temple, which is Eden. And that became the template idea for rest, for temple, for God's dwelling. And this idea of rest with God echoes in the words of David's most famous psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. That is soul rest. And this is exactly what the book of Revelation tells us will happen in the end. The rest and dwelling with God that we were originally given in Eden will ultimately be restored in God's final kingdom on earth. Revelation 21 says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. So I think you're getting the picture here that this theme of rest plays a major role in God's story of redemption from beginning to end. And that's exactly what the, the weekly Sabbath is all about. It's yet another Old Testament foretaste or picture of God's ultimate rest. And because the weekly Sabbath was only given to Israel, keeping it identified you as a member of Yahweh's family. No other nation was commanded to keep Shabbat. Not Egypt, not Assyria, not the Hittites. The weekly Sabbath was for Israel alone. And of course, it wasn't intended as God's final state of rest for mankind because it was a temporary rest that was to be continually repeated every week. It's exactly like how under the old covenant law, the animal sacrifices for sin atonement were required every single year. They were temporary and they had to be repeated. And when we get to chapter 10 of Hebrews, the author is going to show us how those sacrifices commanded under the old covenant were actually just a reminder of sin. They were given to point us to Jesus. And then Jesus came and sacrificed himself on the cross as our ultimate atonement for sin. And now, Hebrews 10, 18 says, there is no longer any offering for sin. Jesus fulfilled the blood offering for sin once and for all. So you can see how this, 
repeated reminder of sin under the old covenant was fulfilled once and for all by Jesus and is therefore no longer required. Well, the same thing is true of the weekly Sabbath. The repeated reminder of rest under the old covenant that identified you as a member of God's family was fulfilled once and for all by Jesus and is therefore no longer required. It's no longer Sabbath keeping that identifies us as as members of God's family. It's faith in Jesus. The old covenant Sabbath is is a picture of our ultimate rest in Christ. Colossians 2 says that the Sabbath, along with many other old covenant commands, is a shadow, but Jesus is the reality. Colossians 2.16, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So although God's full Edenic vision in which we dwell in his household in perfect shalom has not yet been fully restored, it has begun. It began with Jesus. So when we place our faith in Christ, he provides rest for our souls. This is what the author of Hebrews is getting at. And he continues in verse 7. Again, he appoints a certain day, today saying through David so long afterward in the words already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So the author's adding some urgency here. He says the day for entering God's rest is today. He doesn't want his readers to put it off. As he warned in the, in the opening verses of chapter 2, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Don't put it off. Don't drift away, right? And this reference here to Joshua is significant. It, it kind of sticks out because if you pay attention to that name, it, it makes the author's whole point. Donald Hagner writes this. In the Septuagint, the Hebrew name Yehoshua, Joshua, was translated in Greek as Jesus. While Joshua, the Jesus of the Old Testament, was unable to bring the Israelites fully into the realization of the promises made by God, The Jesus of the New Testament did accomplish this. The analogy must have occurred to the minds of the Hellenistic Jewish Christians as they read their Septuagint. Our author must consciously be thinking of this analogy when he goes out of his way to refer to Joshua, an otherwise unnecessary reference. So the human Yehoshua in the Old Testament couldn't do what Yeshua, Jesus, ultimately did for us. Even the rest that was found in the promised land, which Joshua eventually did lead the Israelites into, was not God's ultimate rest. If it was, the author points out in verse 8, God wouldn't have spoken of another day later on. Canaan was another foreshadowing of God's true rest, right? There's something more, something bigger out there. And that's what the author of Hebrews wants us to focus on. He continues in verse 9. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. The writer says, so then. So he's introducing the conclusion of his argument here. He says, there remains a Sabbath rest. And this is important because it introduces the Greek word sabbatismos, which isn't found anywhere else in the Bible. In fact, this is the very first occurrence of that word in all of Greek literature which is why some scholars believe that the author of Hebrews coined that term himself. So how are we to understand this Sabbath rest that remains? Well, we can glean a lot from the context, right? So throughout this passage, he's been laboring the idea of entering God's rest, right? Which is a rest that is in God, and it's also a possession of God. It's God's rest. And we enter it by faith. This is the Sabbath rest, the sabbatismos that he's speaking of. He's not talking about a repeated weekly Shabbat or or even a a physical rest from labor and activity, but rather a spiritual rest from works, right? The, the, The Sabbath rest that remains is the soul rest that we find in Jesus who said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy, heavy laden, leave your works behind, he says, right? And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. 
This is a rest of salvation and eternal life. But here's the thing. The author of Hebrews is not talking about an end times rest or, or something that we won't enter into until our natural life ends. He says in verse 7 that God appoints a certain day today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. This is a rest that can be entered into today. It's the eternal life that begins the moment we put our faith in Jesus. Right? In John 3, Jesus calls it being born again. The Apostle Paul wrote that if anyone is in Christ, he is, present tense, a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So to be in Christ is to enter God's rest. So the writer of Hebrews says in verse 9, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And then he describes that rest in verse 10. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. And there are a couple schools of thought on what the author means in verse 10. Right Now, some read it as referring to Jesus. They read it as saying, uh, For he who has entered his rest has also ceased from his labor as God did from his. Right? This is kind of how the, the King James translates it. So they see the he in this verse as Jesus. In other words, they, they read it as, God rested when he, re when he finished the work of creation, and his son Jesus rested when he completed the work of new creation. And while the Greek grammar could be interpreted that way, there are half a dozen problems with reading Jesus as the implied subject of this passage. One of which is the fact that nowhere else in this passage is Jesus referred to. So to suddenly invoke Christ, but to do so using this indirect, ambiguous language would sort of be at odds with the author's train of thought. Right? And there are also more technical reasons why it doesn't seem to make sense that he would be referring to Jesus here. In fact, if you check out Paul Ellingworth's excellent commentary on the Greek text for this verse, you can read all about it. So, I subscribe to the other school of thought, which says the context of this verse implies a general reference rather than specifically speaking of Jesus. In other words, he's saying, anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from His. Donald Guthrie puts it this way, It is God's rest, and therefore has no lesser pattern. God's people share His rest. What He did, they do. By becoming identified with Him, they enter into His experiences. There's no doubt that the writer is implying that the believer's present Sabbath rest is as much a reality as God's rest. It is not some remote hope, but a hope immediately realizable. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And this is a big deal because the weekly Mosaic Sabbath is a sort of gateway drug that has led so many Christians away from Jesus and into this false theology of Torahism, which teaches that Christians are required to keep the Old Covenant law. And that's just not biblical. In fact, there are three big implications uh, in what this verse is telling us about the Sabbath rest that remains. First is the idea that God gives us the opportunity to enter into His rest, to be a, a part of His family, but it's based on the work of Jesus, not our own efforts. Right? Hebrews 2 talks about how Jesus, as the pioneer or, or founder of our faith, brought many sons to glory and is not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. And, and how do we enter his rest? By faith. And the idea of entering through faith is then linked to a rest from our own works. We enter by faith, not by works. Second, the fact that we enter God's rest by faith in Jesus means that we are connected to Jesus. Believers are united with Christ in a profound way. Romans 6 says that even includes being united in his death and resurrection. Verse 4, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. We weren't physically buried and resurrected with Jesus, of course. It's a spiritual and a relational connection, and it's every bit as real. This is a profound truth. 
And the author of Hebrews says that we're also united with Jesus in his rest from all his works. That means that Jesus is our Shabbat, our ultimate Sabbath, our ultimate rest. We are joined to him in his rest, right? On the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. And back in in chapter one of Hebrews, in the opening verses, the author told us that after making purification for sins, Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And he'll repeat that same statement in chapter 10. We've talked before about how, how this idea of sitting down at the right hand of God is not only symbolic of authority, but of completion. You sit down when your work has been accomplished. So we, we are united to Jesus in his rest every bit as much as we're united to him in his death and his resurrection. That means that Jesus is our Sabbath. The Old Covenant Sabbath pointed us to Jesus, the true Sabbath. As we saw in Colossians 2, the Sabbath day is a shadow. Christ is the reality. Now, that said, we are certainly free to observe, to observe the Old Covenant Sabbath if we want. Well, except the death penalty part, of course. And I certainly believe that the, the moral principles behind those Sabbath commands are still in effect, right? The necessity of rest and setting time aside for God, both personally and communally, of remembering what He's done in our lives, of remembering that He is the source of our salvation, that God is our, our ultimate provider and sustainer, that we are to, to, to tend to the needs of those around us, including not just our family, but those who work for us and foreigners and even animals. These are all Sabbath principles but they no longer need to be lived out in the context of a a mandated seventh day rest. Jesus is our true and real Sabbath. And the third implication of verses nine and 10 is actually what I just alluded to. If our rest is in Jesus and he is our Sabbath, then Christians don't need a weekly Sabbath observance. It's permitted, but it's not required. And here's the thing. If you want to voluntarily choose to keep a seventh day Sabbath, that's great, go for it. I have many friends that do, but be careful. Don't start thinking as many of our Torah keeping friends do that keeping the seventh day Sabbath will somehow contribute anything to your righteousness or or God loving you more or to your salvation. These things are already 100% covered through faith in Jesus. And no amount of Sabbath keeping can ever add even an ounce to that. It, it won't contribute anything to your standing before God. In fact, to claim that Sabbath keeping or, or any keeping of the old covenant law at all defines us as children of God or expresses our relationship with God or is how we show him that we love him is to fail to recognize the work and the staggering significance of Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Messiah and our Lord. He is what all those mosaic rituals and ceremonies pointed to. Jesus is the whole point of the Torah. So we don't need to add Torah stuff into our walk with Jesus. Jesus never commanded anyone to keep the Sabbath or eat kosher or keep the feasts. Again, we're free in Christ to do those things if we want, but to think that they somehow add anything to what Jesus has done for us is to fall into the trap of works righteousness, of merit-based thinking, of believing that we have to earn something that God in his abundant grace and mercy has freely given to us as a gift through faith. Romans 5.17 calls it the free gift of righteousness. It is not a result of works so that no one may boast. And one last thing to note on the idea of Sabbath before we move on. When the author of Hebrews talks about God's rest that is still available to us, he's not talking about a temporary rest of inactivity like Israel took on the weekly Sabbath. He's talking about the rest of completion that God took on the seventh day of creation, like the resurrected Jesus took when he sat down at the right hand of God. This is the pattern for the believer's rest. Colossians 2.10 says, In Christ you have been brought to fullness. Some translations say, you are complete in him. Believers have become complete in Jesus. So the author of Hebrews is urging his readers to hold fast to their faith because faith in Jesus is the only way anyone can be saved. It's the only way for us to enter what he calls God's rest. 
And it goes on in verse 11, Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. And again, for the author of Hebrews, unbelief is disobedience. He says, Stir up your faith so that you don't fall in the wilderness of the world like the Israelites who didn't believe fell and failed to make it in. Right? This is reminiscent of the words of the Apostle Paul who wrote in his last letter shortly before he was executed, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but to also to all who have longed for his appearing. The writer of Hebrews is urging his readers to, to finish the race strong and keep the faith, right? And the time for entering God's rest, he says, is today. Don't put it off, right? And then in the final two verses of our passage, he takes a sort of unexpected turn. In fact, because these next two verses stand alone and have a sort of poetic character, some scholars think this might be some sort of early hymn. Verse 12 for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. That is some extraordinary imagery. And here we have another scholarly debate. In verse 12, when the author says, the word of God is all these things, what exactly is he speaking of? Is he talking about God's spoken word? Does he mean the, the word of God as in the written scriptures? Is he referring to Jesus as the word of God? These ideas are all very closely related, of course, and I actually think any of them could work in context. In fact, I think an acceptable answer here is sort of all of the above. His, the spoken word of God, the written word of God, and Jesus himself are all living and active and able to discern our hearts. So however you want to take that phrase, the point the author's making is pretty clear. He's using this poetic imagery to refer to the fact that God himself knows the completeness of a person, right? He knows the deepest parts of our nature, even down to our thoughts and our intentions. Now, this passage may have brought Psalm 139 to the minds of, of the author's Jewish readers. And that's the psalm that begins, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. Now, depending on where we are in our relationship with God, this can be a scary idea, right? To be so completely exposed and naked before the holy living God in such a profound way. It'll either send us running from God or even cause us to deny Him, or it'll bring us to our knees in gratitude, knowing that our Heavenly Father knows and sees us to that degree, and in His mercy and loving kindness, He accepts us when we place our faith in His Son. And I believe the author of Hebrews is reminding his mostly Jewish readers about this because they're undergoing persecution because of their faith in Jesus. Some were thinking that, it would, that walking away from Christianity might bring them some instant relief, right? If they walked away from Jesus, well then, their unbelieving Jewish friends and family would welcome them back and, and then the Roman government would stop harassing them, right? And the writer is reminding them that there's someone far more significant that they'll have to answer to if they walk away. And God can't be fooled. He knows us completely, right? You, you can't run from him. That same psalm goes on to say in verse 7, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. And here's the thing about this psalm. The writer's expressing these truths about the all-knowing, ever-present God as good news. He's taking comfort in the fact that God knows us so well. He says in verse 9, If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. 
And so the author of Hebrews is, encourages his readers, let us therefore strive to enter God's rest because the promise of entering God's rest is still available. It still stands. The time to do it is today. And the way to do it is by placing your faith in Jesus. In the last episode, we talked about how we are eternally secure if we believe, right? The author said in the previous chapter, we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Just like the Israelites who died in the wilderness and weren't able to enter God's rest because of their unbelief, salvation is not about our works. It's not about keeping the old covenant law. It's about faith. And as Michael Heiser says about our salvation, that which cannot be obtained through moral perfection cannot be lost through moral imperfection. Our salvation is secure if we believe. Okay, so this is a great spot to wrap up. Uh, we're going to continue in our next episode, starting at Hebrews 4, verse 14, and working our way into chapter 5. Thanks for tuning in. Shalom.